But I wanted to start off with the space news. A couple different things here. <clears throat> First one was on Friday morning, a meteor uh, exploded over Russia. And about 4,000 buildings were affected, and over 1,000 people uh, were injured. So that's the first bit of news. So that's a, that's a pretty big event. Uh, the second space-related news, an asteroid rocked uh, that has been named DA-14 by whoever it is that names rocks that fly by, <laughs> uh, passed Earth on Friday afternoon, so just, just a few hours after the, the meteor exploded over Russia. It passed Earth. It was 17,000 miles away, but for space items passing Earth, that's extremely close. It was actually inside uh, TV satellites. So it was in between TV satellites and satellites that are up there in space and Earth. It was the size of a, an apartment building, so pretty big. Uh, the scientists say that it is the, uh, the closest item of that size detected uh, since they've been keeping track, and it's also one of the, the largest, too. And they say 30 years ago, it actually couldn't have been, just because of the, the technology that's advanced, it actually couldn't have been detected 30 years ago. Uh, so that's why they're saying, you know, it's it's the largest, it's the closest as far as we know, but 30 years ago we couldn't have detected this uh, had it passed 30 years ago. So just something to keep in mind that, you know, technology changes and how we track these things gets better. I have an update and a little bit more in-depth uh, on the, the asteroid that passes Earth. And here's a clip from uh, ABC Nightline uh, from a few days ago. A giant asteroid is barreling towards Earth eight times faster than a speeding bullet, passing closer to us than the satellites that broadcast this very program. But what if it were on a crash course? Here's ABC's Neil Karlinski. On a sliding scale of things that can ruin your day, you may want to put this one at the top of the list. The asteroid, with the not-so-catchy name DA-14, is hurtling towards Earth right now at a rate eight times faster than a speeding bullet. And while it will miss, disaster won't be averted by much. It will graze the Earth's atmosphere Friday afternoon at about 17,000 miles out. Remember, all of those satellites out there that give us our global positioning, that tell our iPhone where we are, those are at 22,000 miles. So this is actually going to pass between the Earth and the satellites that give us our direct TV every day. That's a close shave. Hollywood loves this kind of thing. Exhibit A, Bruce Willis's Armageddon. But DA-14 and others like it are no joke. Which is why a trio of big brains from NASA, Apollo 9 astronaut Rusty Schweikert, space station astronaut Ed Liu, and bonafide rocket scientist Scott Hubbard have become the asteroid hunters, launching their own mission to find asteroids that are on a collision course with our world. This asteroid is important because it's a wake-up call that we should be looking out there. These things do hit the Earth. The last near disaster was averted by pure luck. It was 1908 and a huge asteroid made a direct hit, fortunately into Tunguska, Siberia, where a thousand miles of trees and wildlife were decimated. Just imagine if the bullseye had been New York or Chicago. If a very large asteroid hit, and I'm talking about something that is miles across, then it would probably create the same kind of disaster that wiped out the dinosaurs. Amazingly, no one knew DA-14 was headed our way until a Spanish dentist and amateur astronomer randomly discovered this grainy proof a year ago. Of all of the asteroids that are out there that come near the Earth and that can do harm if they hit the Earth, we only know 1% now. 99% of them, we don't even know where they are. As anyone who's seen Star Wars knows, calculating the odds of getting hit by an asteroid is no small task. Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. An asteroid of this size actually hits the Earth in a typical person's lifetime, let's just say your lifetime, with about a 1 in 3, 1 in 4 chance. So, got a coin here. If I was to flip this twice, okay. and if I got heads twice, yeah. And there's another heads. Sorry, we got smacked. <laughs> the asteroid hunters are raising money to launch their own asteroid early warning system called 
Sentinel, a dedicated infrared space telescope scanning the stars for threats. So what if they find one on a collision course, then what? The movie Armageddon had an idea. There have been lots of movies, of course, <laughs> that say, oh yeah, we'll send uh, Bruce Willis and uh, we'll blow it up with an atomic bomb. Why don't we just send up 150 nuclear warheads and blast that rock apart? And that is the wrong answer. Never get your physics from Hollywood movies. <laughs> You only need to change the velocity of an asteroid by something like a millimeter per second. So, to give you an example, that's about the speed that an ant crawls. The team says the solution is to run into a large asteroid or tug at it with a spaceship they call a space tractor, just to give it a little nudge. It's pretty big thinking for what seems like a far-out problem. But when you've seen our planet from space, you apparently look at things in a completely different light. When you look at the Earth uh, from space and you begin to identify not just with your country or your continent, but with the whole Earth, you realize that this is such a precious place. It's not science fiction. These men believe their work is necessary to protect all of us. I'm Neil Karlinski for Nightline in Seattle. So that clip from ABC News uh, Nightline show, it was actually from Thursday night, so it had not, the asteroid had not yet passed over Earth, uh, in case you got that vibe from it a little bit. But I, I was disappointed that they said that the answer is not, <laughs> the answer is not like we've seen in Hollywood movies. And they mentioned Armageddon there, and if anybody noticed, actually the, the my intro music today on the show was actually from uh, Armageddon. I'm a big fan of the movie, and I love their soundtrack. Uh, anyway, back to the story. Um... I have somebody joining me now on the show to clear up a few things and answer a few questions. And it is Dr. Marvin Bolt, and he is the Vice President of Collections at Adler Planetarium in Chicago and Director of the Webster Institute for the History of Astronomy. He has authored and co-authored several books on the topic of astronomy, has taught at the University of Notre Dame, and done research in over two dozen countries. Uh, welcome, Dr. Bolt. Well, thank you for inviting me, John. Hey, no problem. Thanks so much for coming on today. So we see these couple of events that happened in the last week. Uh, how much warning do we usually have of something like this, whether it's the, the, the Russian, which I know these are two probably very different events, but you can touch on either one or one of them. Uh, the, the first, the, the Russian media that exploded over Russia, and then the asteroid. How much, how much warning do we have of events like that? So let's take the asteroid first. The uh, official name of this asteroid is 2012 DA14, which means it was first discovered in 2012, and the DA14 is the designation of, of the month uh, in which it was discovered in the half month. So it's a rather ugly way of telling us exactly when it was discovered. And this thing has a size of about 30 meters, and if that were to run into the Earth, uh, this would be an extinction level uh, event. Now, you might think, well, 17,000 miles, that's, that's pretty close, but that's still more than twice the diameter of the Earth. So um, it's actually not a near miss. It's, um, well, a near collision would be uh, more accurate, but it's still quite a ways away from actually running into the Earth. So even though it's the biggest one that's come that close, in an uh, astronomical scale, it still uh, wasn't that close to actually colliding. So how much how much warning as far as time do we ha usually have uh, of those types of things? You said, well, I guess the, the one was discovered in 2012. And as far as the, the, the Russian uh, meteor, is that, I know that they mentioned in there that they kind of didn't have a lot of warning and some guy just discovered it on his map. How, off, how far ahead did they know about that? Well, things of the size of DA-14, uh, since it was discovered uh, a year ago, you'd have about a year's notice for something uh, of that size. There are seven different automated programs that are tracking asteroids, and what they do is they take a, a picture of the, uh, of the stars, and you take another one of the same region, and you do this multiple times, and most of the stars are fixed. And anything that moves, uh, a dot that seems to move, that's going to be a moving object. And you can actually track its orbit that way. And so this is an automated system now from seven different places that do this. And a couple of hundred thousand of these asteroids are actually being tracked, and orbits have been calculated for them. And then you can figure out, well, where, uh, where are they and where are they going to go? And of those, only a 
small handful really are going to cross Earth's orbit. Now, even if they cross Earth's orbit, you can think of it like planes uh, and their paths crossing each other. Their paths, in a sense, might cross each other if you look from above, but if one's at 10,000 feet and one's at 20,000 feet, it's still really not much of a collision, uh, likelihood, or a, or a risk. And that's the case with most of these objects. Even if they would cross the Earth's orbit, their height, so to speak, is not going to make it actually come into, uh, into contact with the Earth's orbit. And even if it comes into the Earth's orbit, there's still a, a very small chance that the Earth is going to be at that point in the orbit. So the, the likelihood of a large uh, object running into the Earth is, in a sense, quite small. The, the flip side of that is there's a lot of this space junk out there. And so, in fact, every day, thousands of very small objects about the size of a grain of rice or smaller actually crash into the Earth. But uh, objects like the fireball over Russia, which was uh, somewhere around 5 to 15 meters or so in size, that you expect to hit the Earth every 5 to 10 years or so. All right, so if it hits every 5 or 10 years, now you think, well, where is it going to hit? Well, 70% of the Earth is water, so there's a 70% chance that it's going to hit water. And of the land, most of that is going to be unoccupied, unpopulated. And so even if it were to hit land, the likelihood of it hitting Earth uh, in a place where it causes uh, catastrophe is, is really quite small. That is great to hear, certainly for those of us who inhabit Earth. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I think people worry about this a lot. And uh, movies like Star Wars um, have, have created this impression that if you were to fly through the asteroid belt, uh, this would be really, really dangerous. So let me, let me um, answer that one, too, because uh, I want to clear up a misconception. The, the picture we have from Star Wars is that you'd have to be a, a super navigator to, to make your way through the asteroids. So I'll give you an analogy here. Um, asteroids, let's say on average size, the larger ones may be a, a kilometer in size. The nearest one to you would be 5 million kilometers away. Now that's a long way. So what does that mean on sort of a, a more comprehensible scale? Well, let's reduce the size of the asteroid to a size of, a, of an ordinary potato. And a potato is actually a good analogy because most asteroids are not circular, but they're sort of oblong-shaped like a potato, and they've got little pits and craters on them, and they kind of look like potatoes. Well, if you reduce the size of a typical asteroid to the size of a potato, the next nearest potato would be over 400 miles away. So, uh, you know, space is mostly empty. And even though there's a lot of this space junk flying around, um, there's a really small chance that it's going to cause a devastating kind of event. But of course, over time, uh, there's enough of these things that are uh, around that uh, you will from time to time have, have pretty serious impacts, like the one in Tunguska in 1908. That's the, one of the biggest ones uh, we know in, uh, in recorded human history, at least. And for people who maybe aren't, aren't experts on the subject or, or just are listening in, could you define just briefly the difference between a meteorite, a meteor, and an asteroid? I know sometimes when, when I turn on the news or whatever, it's almost like they're interchangeable, and it's hard to keep track of which is which and the differences between uh, those three. So if you could just briefly do that for anybody listening. Sure. So most of these, uh, these terms are sort of interchangeable in, in common parlance, but it really refers to size. And so um, asteroids are um, sort of on the, on the neighborhood of, uh, of a kilometer or, or so. And then meteoroids are things that would be of size 10 meters across or smaller. And so a meteoroid is... Um, is going to be orbiting around the sun in some path, so is an asteroid, but it's really the difference in, in size that, uh, that distinguishes them. Then when they're uh, on the ground, uh, they're, they become meteorites. Same object, really, but uh, just different names depending on size and, uh, and where we find them. 
Okay, great. Thank you. That that clears it up because, like I said, I, I hear them interchangeably, and I'm always like, now, how is that different <laughs> than these other two? Uh, okay, one more question. I really appreciate you coming on today. Uh, we're talking to Dr. Marvin Bolt, uh, Vice President of Collections at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago here on BethelPilotRadio.com. Uh, one last question. I saw that the, according to the Deep Space Industries, uh, they say that if uh, if we could somehow get the asteroid and, and the, the raw materials on there are worth about $200 billion. It's hard to tell exactly how much they're worth, but they said they estimated at about $200 billion. So I'm just throwing this out there. I was, I was wondering if this is a possibility. Would it be, would it be possible to build some kind of a, uh, a space lasso, maybe that we can pull this in, chip it off, and then sell it on the black market, you, you know, just between you and I? Would, would that be possible to pull? Next time one of these things passes, pull, pull it in and, you know, just sell it on the black market? Well, you know, people have, have actually talked about this uh, because the, uh, the, the attractiveness of finding materials on, uh, on, on small, uh, small bodies like asteroids, planetoids, and the like uh, may be really attractive that you can find them more easily and uh, bring them down to Earth. Of course, the, the difficulty is, the, uh, is not only the cost of getting to the asteroid and back again, but the, ex- the, uh, the, the time, the expense, and the risk of uh, things going awry. But I know there are people who have, uh, have talked about it. Um, it's actually not completely unrelated to the question of deflecting asteroids because, uh, you know, we've got all these hundreds of thousands that we're, we're tracking. What if one is computed to, to run into the Earth? Well, uh, one of the things you have to do is know the difference between an asteroid that is a solid body and one that's sort of an aggregate of rocks and rubble. Uh, The first kind, you can set off a a more violent reaction and deflect it. But the second one, um, if you do that, you just end up with lots of smaller piles that uh, would actually increase the risk and spread the risk of of one of these things blowing up uh, in in a place where you wouldn't want it to blow up. So there's um, still sort of more in the science fictiony uh, kind of discussion of how you would actually move, deflect, or capture one of these. But um, you know, there, if the motivation is sufficiently high, uh, I think private enterprise might be the way to uh, to do this rather than a, uh, a national uh, mission for which I think people have less patience. Uh, than than someone who wants to take on the risk themselves. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm going to start saving my pennies, and next time one of these passes, I'm just going to uh, go out there and grab it so I can I can sell it. <laughs> it'll, I, it'll, I'll buy it off you. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. I already got a buyer. Perfect. Uh, what more can I ask? Well, it's been really great having you on today. Thanks so much for, for answering our questions. Again, Dr. Marvin Bolt, uh, Vice President of Collections at Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Thanks for coming on. You're welcome, John. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, No problem. Great to have you. Thanks.